So we have a uh, third talk of the day. So uh, if you're rushing for a bathroom break, please come back as quickly as you can. Um, so we've, we've, we've heard already this week uh, about the evolution of the neocortex from uh, John Cass and Leia Krubitzer. We've heard uh, about the development from uh, Zoltan Molnar. We've had some insights into some of the computational properties that we should expect to find in cortex from Gary Marcus. And uh, uh, we've also heard about the behavior, perhaps, that, that the cortex is involved in generating from other speakers. And, and today, I think we've had a great talk from Henry about uh, the connectivity of uh, the cortex. And so I think we're at a very appropriate point in the week to start thinking about brain activity and how brain connectivity uh, might be giving rise to certain patterns of brain activity. So um, the talk we're going to have next is going to be looking at the dynamics of brain activity. And also we're moving now from uh, biological data towards modeling because uh, to really understand what's going on, we do have to start using computational models and uh, we're going to begin to do that with this talk. Well, we are if, if we uh, get some... So uh, Murray Shanahan is a professor of cognitive robotics at Imperial College. Um, I, I think, Murray, you started at Imperial and then went to Cambridge for your PhD. That's right. And then been back at Imperial ever since, which is a fine place to be. <laughs> and uh, Murray uh, began in computer science, I think, and uh, up until uh, around 2000, he was working primarily in, I guess, symbolic AI. But since that time, He's had a growing interest in the brain. So he's come into the study of the brain with a strong background in understanding computation. I think he's known for his work originally on the frame problem in AI, which is this question of uh, if you're trying to think about a, a problem, what's relevant and what's not relevant? And that's a massive problem in AI. And he's also known for his work on uh, global workspace theory, which is this question of how the brain uh, deals with uh, concepts that's manipulating. I think it relates to Gary's, mark, uh, Gary's talk about uh, this problem of how we have variables, how we do high-level computation and cognition in the brain. Uh, but today, I think Murray's going to talk about neurodynamics, which is uh, th this question of how we get activity patterns in the brain. And I think, hopefully, this is going to have some connection with the anatomy that, that might well, be yes. useful. Anyway, I'll pass over to you, Murray. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, there's good, good news and bad news, or bad news and good news. The bad news is that the previous speaker has rendered controversial certain aspects of my talk. Um, but the good news is that everyone wants lunch, so I can shorten my talk accordingly and somewhat gloss over those aspects. So that's what I might, uh, uh, I might end up doing. So I'm going to concentrate on somewhat on the mathematical modelling. Uh, but first of all, uh, I want to... Oh, OK. So an overview of the talk is I'm going to go over a little bit of background, uh, relevant background material, before I launch into uh, describing a mathematical abstraction, which is uh, really a, um, a mathematical model of synchronization, which I'm going to use to model certain uh, synchronization uh, phenomena, certain exotic synchronization phenomena, in particular uh, metastability. Then this would be the, uh, the controversial bit in the light of the previous uh, uh, speaker's uh, talk. So we might touch on, on that a little bit and maybe, uh, I don't know if we've got time, go into the controversy a, a little bit. Uh, then uh, I'm going to talk about how this mathematical abstraction has been used by uh, some other people um, to, uh, to do some um, sort of computational neuroscience and how it relates to some empirical uh, results. And at, right at the end, I might even talk about some, about some work that we're doing uh, with magic mushrooms. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the plan if we, get, if we get there. But first of all, I just want to show you uh, how we could do, uh, if I can find it. I just want to show you a, a, a wonderful video. Now, uh, some, some of you may have seen this video before. So this video is, um, was produced by the group of Misha Ahrens in uh, uh, the Harvard Medical School. And what this shows is this is the, uh, uh, the brain of the larva of a, of a zebrafish. And this zebrafish larva, so it's a transgenic zebrafish, and it's been uh, genetically modified uh, in such a way that when uh, the uh, neurons are uh, active, 
then they um, uh, express a dye, which is a fluorescent dye, which means to say when you shine light on, uh, on this, this sort of fairly transparent brain, that's one of the great things about these zebrafish, uh, when you shine light on, uh, on the brain, you can see uh, literally the, the active neurons because they express this dye um, uh, when, they're, when they're active, and it's to do with the calcium chemistry. So you can see these neurons literally uh, glowing. So, uh, so, so this is an amazing piece of, uh, piece of video, and especially when you consider that this is the larva of the zebrafish, and it's embedded uh, in a little bit, bit of uh, gel. So it's a completely stationary larva, and I, according to the uh, paper, the uh, zebrafish develops perfectly normally after, the, after this uh, and is released from the, uh, from the gel. But the amazing thing is, is how rich and complex the activity that's going on inside the brain of this uh, stationary zebrafish larva is. It's doing all kinds of, all kinds of interesting stuff. And what I'm really interested in in, 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 in my work at the moment is um, the kind of, you know, what was, it, what was going on there, right? <laughs> uh, is, 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 the sort of, is the role of rich, complex neural dynamics in high-level cognition. And it's a big, you know, huge, huge question, and I'm not going to pretend that we've got, got uh, answers to how these things relate to each other, but I'm interested in exploring the relationship. Um. Okay, so a little bit of uh, background. So, uh, yes, as you just saw the video. Okay, so metastability uh, in the brain. Um, so there's this very nice quote that my daughter pointed out to me um, from, uh, merely, uh, from the introduction, actually, to, I think, her, by her own introduction to Frankenstein. Invention does not consist in creating out of void, but out of chaos. And that's quite a good... Uh, um, uh, so, so and what I'm going to be talking about today is not really uh, chaos, but it's kind of rich, complex dynamics, and I think that this is uh, a very, very important point. Okay, so the particular hallmark of the rich, complex dynamics that I'm interested in uh, is metastability. So let me try and pin down what, what we mean by metastability a little bit. Uh, the term is somewhat up for grabs, but there are various mathematically precise measures that we can, that we can uh, use to try and capture capture uh, you know, what is a, 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 an intuitive concept that's still somewhat up for grabs. Um, okay, so basically a system is metastable, so we're thinking of a, a particular of a dynamical system here, so, a, so really a kind of a mathematically well-defined ent entity. But a, si a system is, meta, uh, is metastable if, due to its intrinsic dynamics, it dwells in transient, attractor-like states without actually achieving stability. So the kind of things that people, uh, uh, that dynamical systems, people in dynamical systems like to study are, are often um, systems that converge on a stable state or, or, or never converge on a stable state. But this metastate, metast metastability is this sort of halfway uh, thing where you've got a system that, that, that uh, sort of dwells for a longer than statistically expected in an attractor-like state, but it never actually falls right into it. It never actually converges on that state and becomes stable, but rather it's going to migrate between a number of these metastable states. Now, in the brain, so in the brain, these attractor-like states include um, states with long-range uh, high synchrony. And this relates very much, as we'll see in just a second, to uh, actually to the work of Pascal Fries that was alluded to in the questions uh, just, just now. Um, and we can, so this is, this is the kind of metastable state that I'm interested in, uh, is, is where we've got um, long-range synchronization. And we can use the variance in synchrony, so, uh, so, so how, much vary, how much statistical variation there is in the amount of synchrony uh, in regions, we can use that as a, a measure of metastability. Um, and the interesting thing is that high metastability often goes hand in hand with a large uh, repertoire of states, and this is, I think, how it relates to this kind of quote and the and and the uh, the important idea of playfulness uh, playfulness in the brain, um, because uh, you know you if you want a brain that's going to explore a, a, a large number of possibilities, which is an absolutely essential thing for learning, then you want something that has a large repertoire of states. So, um, so I'm, I'm interested in this, in this repertoire. 
So, yeah, so a large repertoire of metastable states uh, is a sign of playful exploratory dynamics, which I would claim, in line with this quote at the beginning, is, is, uh, is a pretty good thing for the, for the brain. And that's, I think, is the sort of thing we see in, the, uh, uh, in, in that uh, zebrafish uh, larva. We see the act, uh, uh, all this activity going on there. And in the resting state of the in human brain resting state, there's an awful lot still going on, even though you're resting. Okay, and then this does relate to, um, so, so this is all kind of the background to the mathematical model that we'll be looking at. Um, so this does very much relate to this uh, communication through coherence hypothesis of Pascal Fries um, that was mentioned just now. Um, so, so Pascal Fries was uh, addressing the question of what is the functional role of all these synchronized oscillation that we pick up in all kinds of different ways in the brain. Uh, and he proposed that, uh, that synchronous activity allows the opening and closing of communication channels between uh, different uh, populations of neurons. And basically when two, so this is the kind of crude version of the hypothesis that he originally had, and it's been, been made a bit more sophisticated since then. Um, uh, so, so in that uh, original version, when two populations uh, are oscillating synchronously, then that's when they can exchange spikes. So here we see we ha have a peak of act. So you imagine that you've got two populations of neurons, uh, A and B. And if you have a peak of activity uh, in population A, and that coincides with a peak of activity in uh, a peak of uh, activity in population B, then they're in a position to exchange spikes. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, so if there's elevated activity here, then it means it's going to be more, more receptive to uh, incoming spikes. It's going to be more sensitive to spiking itself. So when the peaks coincide, then that's when uh, there can be an exchange of influence and information between, between these two populations. Whereas by contrast, if we think of a third channel, a third population C, um, which, uh, uh, where, which is um, not synchronized with, uh, with either of these, then... Uh, then there's less opportunity for influence and information to be exchanged between these two, uh, between these populations, because the peaks and the troughs are what coincide. Now, to fill this uh, idea out, you have to think about the whole question of delays and so forth, because uh, you don't want the delays between these populations to mess up this whole idea, and it kind of gets obviously a bit more complicated when you look into the details. But that's the essential idea, and I and, and to some extent. Uh, I'm interested in sort of buying into something, something like uh, this communication through coherence uh, hypothesis. And, uh, and in particular, I'm interested in coalitions of brain processes. So coalitions of brain processes, uh, according to the way I'm thinking of them, is that, so here this is meant to represent, so, so going back to the previous slide, um, so here we've got these three populations, A, B, and C. So here we've got a whole collection of populations uh, in this little ring here. Uh, the ring doesn't mean anything, it's just the way, the way they're arranged on the page uh, to look nice. Um, but, uh, but here we have amongst these various sort of relations of synchrony between these different populations. So this one can be quiescent, say. But these three red ones, uh, so these, these guys are all uh, oscillating in synchrony with each other. So that means that they are uh, a viable coalition. They can all exchange information and influence among each other. Whereas we have other possibilities, so we've got these two populations that are out of synchrony with these, so they're shut out of this coalition. Uh, and this population, it might be active, but there's no, not even any internal um, synchrony, so it's not going to be in a position to, to join, this, this, uh, join the coalition. So I'm, I'm interested in the idea that um, coalition, I'm interested in the idea of coalitions of brain processes where a coalition of brain processes is a collection of populations of neurons that, uh, that are in this kind of synchronization uh, relationship. Um, okay, so that's just sort of some background. And now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a mathematical abstraction for capturing this idea. So, um, so, so, so a little bit of background to this. So I was doing um, uh, some work with spiking neurons and modeling uh, spiking neurons and the, the uh, 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 dynamics of populations of spiking neurons in various kinds of complex networks. And, um, uh, and I published a paper in, in Physical Review E 
And, uh, and, and uh, quite a few people <coughs> said to me when I was presenting this, this work at workshops and conferences, they said, well, why do you need all these spiking neurons? You know, why, why do you need all the complexity of spiking neurons? For the collection of, of properties that you've looked at, you could use a much simpler model. So why, why all the spiking neurons? And I thought, I thought, yeah, okay, you know, maybe you're right. So why don't I look at a simpler model? And so I started thinking about simpler models that can capture related dynamics. And, and I started to get th thinking about um, mathematical models of oscillators and uh, synchronization in, in, in oscillators. So that's how I got to this. So, the, so one uh, such mathematical model is the Kuramoto model. Now this Kuramoto model, what the Kuramoto model captures is it captures the evolution of the, so it's a model of an oscillator, but it's a really, really, really simple uh, model of an oscillator. All it does is it captures the evolution of the phase of the oscillator, which is this theta here, uh, over time. But what we're interested in, so there's no, it doesn't capture amplitude at all, just, it's just looking at the phase of the oscillator. Um, but what we're interested in is collections of oscillators, and so the, uh, the uh, equations that uh, Kuramoto um, uh, describes for his, for his uh, oscillators, they take into account the influence of all the other oscillators that are connected to it. So we're looking at a set of coupled oscillators and how all of these coupled oscillators are pushing and pulling each other around. And of particular interest to uh, Kuramoto was this, uh, uh, the conditions under which a set of such oscillators synchronize. And maybe you're familiar with the, 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 with the classic observations of uh, Huygens in um, the, Dutch, uh, 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 the Dutchman Huygens in, uh, would, I, would have been maybe the 17th century, 18th century, I'm not quite sure. But he first observed the, the, that uh, if you put two, uh, if you had two, he observed there were two clocks with pendulums uh, on the wall and that, uh, and that these two clocks, uh, if you, uh, you know, after a while, the pendulums would sort of synchronize uh, with each other. And that's because the wall, the sort of physical properties of the wall, meant that the two, these two oscillators, because they're basically oscillators, were coupled. And eventually, they become sort of synchronized with each other. Um, and so this kind of phenomenon is, is, uh, is pervasive in nature. Fireflies are another classic example where, where the fireflies, all the flashing uh, sort of becomes all synchronous. And uh, Kuramoto was interested in, in how you model this kind of phenomena of oscillators coming into synchrony with each other. So that's how we get this equation here. So this equation is just, so I, I'm not going to go into, I don't want to go into too much maths, but I don't see why we shouldn't have a little bit of uh, maths. So this is describing the, the, uh, the phase of this the theta of the ith oscillator, and this shows how it changes over time. And this omega i is the natural frequency of the oscillator. So if, you, if, all you ha if the oscillator wasn't connected to anything else, then this phase would just kind of go... Uh, would just increase forever according to this, uh, uh, this natural frequency here. Um, but what in fact happens is that what you're really interested in is the way, is the influence of all, all the other oscillators that it's coupled with. So we're supposing that we've got a system of n oscillators and we're going to sum up the influence of these other n oscillators that are coupled to it. Now this Kij, that represents the strength of the coupling between uh, oscillator J and oscillator I. So we're going to sum up for all of, the, all of our N oscillators, we're going to sum up the influence, which is weighted by this K term, uh, of the other oscillators on this uh, oscillator we're interested in here, the ith oscillator. And we do that by taking the sign here and the difference between the two phases. And we have another little term here. This alpha is a phase lag. So, that's, so we introduce a phase lag between the oscillators. And you, you know, we could parameter, we could index that as well, but we're going to be looking at a constant phase lag with these, with these oscillators. Okay, so here's, uh, here's your sort of uh, vanilla example of what, uh, uh, of what, oscillators, uh, what oscillators can do. So if we take a system of weakly coupled Kuramoto oscillators with similar natu natural frequencies, then they will uh, synchronize in due course. So here we've got a collection of 32 oscillators with zero phase lag in this case. They've, in this case, they've all got identical natural frequencies, I and mean, this is just one example of synchronization. We could vary, we could make the frequencies a little different, and it, the same kind of thing would happen. We've got all-to-all -all coupling. This is the coupling, uh, but we've got random initial phases here, right? So, we, so we all, this is showing. Um, so the, the phases are taken modulo two pi, by the way. So, so we see nice uh, sine waves here. 
Um, and uh, so we have random initial phases, and we set all these things going, and thanks to all that coupling, eventually they all synchronize. And if you uh, to, were to extend this time uh, you know, on forever and ever, then you'd find that, it, in fact, they haven't, they haven't quite completely synchronized yet because it looks really boring if you, uh, uh, you know, if I squash the graph up till they do perfectly. But believe me, they will synchronize perfectly in due course and then will stay uh, synchronized forever and ever. So that's one kind of uh, thing that um, these oscillators do. Now, in fact, if we're thinking from the terms of brain dynamics, this is really not an interesting uh, uh, dynamical regime, total synchronization. Uh, to you know, total synchronization is, is, if anything, it's seizure in the brain. We really don't, we're really not interested in, you know, uh, in, in the idea of everything synchronizing with itself. So, uh, so I, I was looking at this, and then I uh, thought, well, we want to. What we're really interested in is we're interested in um, states where some, uh, some, uh, you know, of these oscillators. So if these oscillators are representing populations of neurons where some of them synchronize and some of them don't synchronize. And I thought, well, you know, surely these guys must have looked into this kind of thing, uh, you know, because this is a whole field or, you know, people study in physics. There are many people who are very interested in, uh, in these oscillators and synchronization. And indeed, I discovered before long that, um, that, they, that people had indeed looked at this uh, uh, slightly different phenomenon whereby you have subsets. So you've got all your oscillators, and a certain subset of the oscillators um, all synchronizes, and then the rest of them don't synchronize. And, uh, you know, and this is much more like the kind of thing that we're interested in when we, when we talk about brain dynamics. Um, so, uh, so this phenomenon, um, uh, so, these are, so these states where, so here I'm showing the, the oscillators divided into the two subs, partitioned into the two subsets, one of which is is desynchronized and the other of which uh, synchronizes perfectly. And again, if you extend this on forever, you'd find that these, uh, that these guys, they never synchronize with each other. They say that the phases stay scattered, whereas these guys stay perfectly synchronized with each other. Um, and so this is, so, they, so the uh, um, physicists who um, discovered this uh, phenomenon uh, um, called them chimera states, after the mythical chimera beast, the chimera, because they thought they were so odd um, uh, uh, whereas, in fact, I think these chimera states are really, the, the f you know, far more interesting than completely synchronized, uh, synchronized states. Okay, so these chimera states, they were only discovered in 2002, so this is quite, in quite interesting. Uh, so when I say discovered, I mean only, the, you know, mathematical ways of capturing this. This, this first paper was in 2002. Um, but then I, 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 you know, thinking about this further and realized that this doesn't, I, neither does this capture what I'm interested in at all either, because I, you know, I, I don't want, uh, I'm not interested in um, states where, where your system of oscillators falls into one state and then stays there forever, because of course the brain doesn't do that. The brain is, uh, you know, is exploratory and is going to be changing, changing all the time. So, so I'm not really, you know, this isn't quite right either. So I started uh, tinkering and, um, and playing around uh, in a very, um, you know, very unscientific and systematic way. I just sort of sat at my uh, terminal and I took these uh, models and I did lots of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of simulations and, and played around with them in all kinds of different ways and um, uh, sort of produced something which I think, uh, you know, is a lot more interesting from the perspective of brain dynamics. And this is the way, uh, this is the way I did it. So the first, th the most important thing um, to, to get this effect um, is to use a complex network. So, so use uh, networks that are, so, so most of the work that, uh, that other people had done before were looking at uniform uh, networks, say a, a fully connected network, for example. Um, but uh, but what you get the most interesting phenomena when you have a complex network. So complex networks are the kinds of things that are small world networks, for example, that we discussed in the, in the, in the previous talk. Um, so what I, looked, um, uh, what I looked at was uh, I started to look at modular networks or community structured networks. So I was looking at, uh, so this is the kind of uh, uh, network that I'm interested in. So I should say that what I mean by a network here is each of these nodes, in the, this is in the context of the, of the um, oscillator model. So each of these nodes in my oscillator model is one oscillator, and each of these 
uh, arcs is, represents that, that the oscillators are coupled. So many of the oscillators are in, in my networks are not going to be coupled at all. And uh, to the extent that they are coupled, they conform to this community or modular structure. So that means to say that you can, what you can do is you can, it's possible to divide up your, your overall set of nodes into subsets. You can partition it into subsets such that the nodes within a subset are densely connected to each other, whereas the nodes in different subsets are uh, more sparsely connected to each other. And you can quantify this notion of community structure and modularity in a mathematically precise way, of course. So I was looking at, so I started looking at these community structured networks. And of course, they are of interest because, perhaps controversially, the brain networks, um, structural networks, uh, you know, appear to be, uh, to be modular in this kind of sense. Okay, now, so under the right kind of circumstances, um, uh, if you have a modular um, uh, set of uh, uh, a modular network of these coupled oscillators, you get these uh, uh, chimera-like states that arise. And this is showing, a set, so each of these little squares is one uh, of these modules. So it's a collection of 32 oscillators, in fact. And these 32 oscillators within a module are densely coupled to, richly coupled to each other, um, uh, whereas they're only sparsely coupled to, uh, to all the other modules. And what you get is you get um, these chimera-like states whereby some of, the, uh, some of the oscillators, some of these um, uh, sets of oscillators become very highly synchronized, like we can see here, and while others at the same time remain uh, desynchronized. And the particularly interesting thing is that the ones that is that the populations that have become highly synchronized are not only internally synchronized, but they're uh, very highly synchronized with each other as well. So they're all in pretty much, these synchronized ones are all in pretty much the same phase relationship to, to each other. So now this, now let, to think back to the whole uh, idea of, of communication through coherence and of coalitions of, uh, uh, of brain processes, where I was thinking about a coalition is a collection of synchronized um, populations of, of neurons. Well, that's what, you know, this is kind of starting to look like it might represent exactly that sort of thing. So that's what I've got in mind. Tony? Are these different runs or are these different sets? No, this is one run. So this is time. So this is one, this is one run, and I've, I've just divided up all the oscillators into their, into the, so, so I've, I've got eight collections of 32 oscillators, and in fact, this is just showing six of those eight, because again, it looks a bit squashed on the slide otherwise. Um, so this is the same time, time axis. This is just time 250 to 270 in the same run, but for each one of those collections of oscillators, yeah? Yeah, there was another question there. them to or in, not to internally the synchronized the community synchronized. can be synchronized between them or not well i don't think it if really both are the synchronized in the same it, way so that, like these two for example oh uh, yes so these two are both desynchronized well i don't think it really makes any sense to talk about synchronization between two okay. communities if they're not synchronized in the first place okay Thank you. so i mean so we could talk about whether these two to are synchronized with each other because they might not be they might be out of phase with each other but when it when they're not even synchronized at all, it doesn't even make, make sure, sense. Okay. So basically, uh, currently, amongst all the kind of oscillators I'm looking at, these guys are making a viable kind of coalition, probably including this guy as well, and these guys have been shut out, okay? Right, so that's a, that's a sort of chimera state. It's similar to the sort of thing that was published and described before, but the interesting thing is, oh, well, just so, so we can quantify synchrony, so there's a standard way of quantifying the synchrony uh, among a collection of oscillators. So now we're looking at, so now I, uh, so, so, so uh, as I said, I'm quantifying now the synchrony within a collection uh, of oscillators. And um, so what this graph shows, and I'll explain it in just a second, is that we, so we might expect these chimera states that you saw previously to be attractors, to sort of to stable, for that to be a, a chimera state, to be a stable state, because that's the kind of thing that everyone had shown uh, before. But in fact, that's not what we see. 
And what we see is that these chimera-like states, they come and go. They're, they're metastable. They come, and they, 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 they come and go. You get different coalitions of, uh, of uh, uh, oscillators, you know, form and then break apart. And then another one will form and break apart. Another one will form and break apart. Now, this is very cool because this is, pretty, this is starting to approximate brain dynamics, I think, a lot more, more closely. Um, so just to give you some of the details here, so this is a graph showing this. So on this graph here, we are quantifying uh, the synchrony within uh, each of these eight populations. So I've got these eight separate communities or modules um, of 32 oscillators each. So this is showing the internal synchrony uh, in each of, these, uh, uh, each of these eight collections of oscillators. So each of these colors is a separate collection of eight of, of uh, is one of the eight collections of 32 oscillators. So if, this, uh, if it's high here, then, they're high, then it's highly internally synchronized. And if it's low, then it's desynchronized. So now what we find is, so, this, so let's just take this point here. So at this time here, sort of for a short period of time here, we've got these three uh, um, populations of oscillators are highly synchronized internally. And I know that in this particular system, if they're highly synchronized internally, they're highly synchronized with each other as well. So here we've got this little coalition here of maybe three. And certainly these guys are, are shut out entirely. And the, you know, I don't know quite what's going on there. And here's another really clear one. So this is quite high uh, synchrony among lots of oscillators, whereas some others are, are, sh are shut out. So, so you have these, uh, um, these chimera-like states, these, co these coalitions of synchronized subsets of oscillators are, um, uh, you know, are forming and breaking apart, and, and then a new one forms and then breaks apart, and then another one forms and breaks apart. So, so I was really kind of pleased to discover this, and especially because, um, because it seems to only arise when you have networks that uh, exhibit the same kind of complex network structure that, uh, that, uh, that, that many people had alleged the brain conformed to. Uh, uh, in particular, this, uh, uh, that they're all small world, um, community structured uh, networks. Okay, so that's the basic kind of system that I'm, that, uh, that, that, that I'm being interested in. And this is the sort of showing the, the, you know, the, the, the main phenomenon. But, but Murray, are, are you going yeah. to give us a physiological benchmark that you say, look, this is what Pascal measures in the brain yeah. with, with these t temporal dynamics and, and these, pr pr let's say, the power spectra and whatever, and these coherent values, and I'm going to give you the same thing? Yeah, I'll get, I'll, I'll get to that, okay? okay? Cool. Um, so, uh, uh, but, you know, but this is, yes, I'll get to that. Um, okay, so I just want to show you some, a couple of, there are a couple of uh, useful you know, measures, very straightforward, statistically very straightforward measures that we can use to, uh, to quantify um, the metastability and to quantify how chimera-like uh, a, a state is. And I don't need to go into that into too much detail. You can kind of take, uh, take my word for it. And one of the things that I, uh, that I showed in the paper was that we only get this phenomenon where you get a lot of metastability and you get all these chimera-like states if we set that phase lag to be just right. So you remember that these are, that there is this phase lag between the oscillators, and you've got to get that just right in order for this to happen. If you don't get that just right, then you either get a state where the oscillators are just com all completely uh, decoherent, or you get a state where they all completely synchronize. So your good old fashioned um, collection of, of, of um, uh, states that they, uh, that they tended to converge on. So it's, it's only, you know, it's, 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 it's quite a fragile state in a way. You've got to get that phase lag just, just right for this to occur. So you, here we see that when this phase lag is just right, we get a peak in the metastability, uh, this metastability measure, and a peak in this kind of chimera index that, that, uh, that I defined. Um, and so that's one uh, uh, useful uh, and interesting measure. And here's another uh, uh, very useful measure, which is to, it's basically, it's, it, this is nothing really sophisticated. It's just, uh, uh, it's just an entropy uh, measure, uh, which basically measure, measures the repertoire of states that this thing produces. So how mixed, this is just if you know your information theory at all, and if you don't, don't worry about it, because all you need to know is that this just tells me how mixed up the set of the collection of states that this system produces uh, over time is. So if it produces all possible states with equal probability, then this 
this is going to be this measure is going to be really high. So it's a measure of the repertoire of states that this thing that this thing produces. And you know, again, if we if we're thinking back to sort of the, the uh, brain dynamics, then potentially we're interested in uh, a dynamical regime where you have a large repertoire of states because that is going to be a highly exploratory, playful brain, whether you're talking about internal dynamics or whether or if it's you know actually interacting with the world in a playful way. Um, okay, so if we take that measure there, uh, then again that we find that so that's the uh, so that's this red thing here. So again we find that that peaks in the same just well pretty much it's actually not quite which is interesting but it's very nearly the same uh, spot uh, that, that those other measures all peak that we get the maximum repertoire of states um, if we if we tune this. Um, phase lag just right. Okay, so now a little ped pedantic point. So I'm going to, I'm going to come on to, to sort of empirical uh, stuff in a minute. Um, uh, but, you know, but I, I should, you know, I should hold up my hand and say that, you know, I'm basically a modeler. So, uh, so what I do is modeling, computer simulation, and, 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 and the mathematics. So, so that was my kind of chief interest in, in coming into this. But then, uh, some, then a number of other people um, showed that you can apply this model and that it actually does, uh, does to some extent, model, uh, you know, it can be empirically validated. So that's, um, so we're coming on to that in just, a, in just a second. But before I do that, I just need to make one, uh, one little sort of uh, pedantic point that, um, that uh, if you recall the equations for these oscillators, I had this term, this alpha term, which was the phase lag, and that's the important thing that you've got to get right to get this interesting state of the, where you've got these metastable chimeras uh, forming. Um, well, uh, so there are different ways of, uh, of capturing a similar kind of um, effect whereby the oscillators, uh, are un whereby there's a sort of something a bit like delay, basically, between the oscillators. And having a, that phase lag term is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to actually introduce an actual delay between the, between the uh, effect of one oscillator on another. And so this is a kind of a mathematic, sounds like a mathematically pedantic point, but in fact, if you, if you use this delay-coupled version rather than the phase-lag version, then um, to my surprise, it turns out that, the, that, that if you do the analogous thing, it doesn't quite work out in the, same, in, the, in the same way. So you don't get the same kind of results that I just described. And yet this time-delayed version where you've got delay uh, delay coupling between the, between the oscillators is much more kind of realistic uh, representation of what's going on in brains because there you do have real temporal delay. So it was important for me to show that the set you got the same kind of results in this delay coupled version. So we published another paper, this is uh, one of my PhD students uh, in chaos, that shows that you get similar kinds of effects basically if you build the network right uh, with this delay coupled version. So that's basically showing the same kind of analogous results uh, where you have a delayed coupled version. Okay, so now, um, uh, so now, I, now we're getting on to the slightly controversial bit because uh, what I want to do now is, is show how this kind of Kuramoto model has been picked up by, uh, by people and, and, and shown to, that to some extent it can model uh, real data, real fMRI data. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over that a little bit. Um, part of the backdrop to that is, uh, is some of the work on structural connectivity um, that was uh, to some extent thrown in, into question by the previous talk, but we'll go through this, this, this anyway. Um, okay, so first of all I want to introduce this notion of a connective core, which is very much like the, the notion of a rich club that was uh, alluded to earlier on. Um, so, so just re recall my complex network that I used uh, in, in those previous computational, um, that computational model. So that was this modular small world network. So it's a modular network. Um, uh, but you'll notice that uh, there's a, well, actually, I need to put up the two slides together. Um, but there's a slight difference between this one and the one that I showed you before. And in the one that I showed you before, well, that was a modular uh, small world network, but it didn't actually have any uh, hubs, didn't have connector hubs. And that, the reason it didn't have connector hubs was, well, the reason this one does have connector hubs is because all of the connections between the communities 
go through a very small number of nodes. So, so this node here is the node that is connecting this whole module to everything else, basically. So this, so this uh, has a, so there's a, that's a, a hub node there. Now, if it were the case, as it was with the earlier diagram, I should have juxtaposed them. Uh, I, I, I don't know what happened to that slide. I did have a slide that juxtaposed them. Um, the earlier picture, which, look, which in your memory will be almost identical, but it wasn't, in fact, because these connections here were distributed around these nodes. So there, was no, there weren't hubs in the, in, in the same, you know, here and here. So the previous uh, network that I showed you, I mean, obviously these are just, you know, these diagrams are just examples. The real networks are larger than this. But in the previous diagram I showed you, it was a modular small world network, but it didn't have hub nodes. Now this one has these connector, connector hubs. Now if we pick out these connect this collection of connector uh, hubs and uh, the connections between them, then we can call that the connective core uh, of, of the network. Okay, so, so, far, so far I think so uncontroversial because here it's just mathematics, right? Whether it, to the extent to which it applies to the brain is another matter. So, uh, Can I just reply to that because... I don't think what you're saying is, is, is in contradiction with what I was saying. Maybe I expressed myself badly. Um, what I was saying was that if you, if you look at the issue of hubs and the overconnectivity of hubs to form rich clubs, mm. if you take out on board the actual data, you fall into a mathematical problem, mm. which is unresolvable. If you look at the clicks, Indeed, you find that there's a core to the cortex very, cl very clearly, mm. but it's not, the same, it's not the same analysis that you've done. Mm. So I'm not disputing in any way that there's a cortical core. We've actually published that there is one, mm. and I think it's a very interesting structure, and I think it be, could be involved in the sort of things that you're alluding to. Mm. Now, what I had to say about the small world, there's no problem. You can fresh hold. Yep. If you fresh hold, then you ignore the weak connections. I started my presentation by saying that weak connections, you can throw them out willy-nilly. Mm. They might be very interesting. And if you keep them on board, then the small world, not that there is not a small world, it's that it's not an emergent property of the system. It's a small world because everything's simply connected to everything at that level. Yeah, sure. So, 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 so there's so nothing so contradictory uh, about what we've been saying. That's no, the point okay, well that's, a, that's a great relief, right? So, I can, so, I, so, so that means the lunch might be postponed a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there's less stuff I have to avoid uh, now. Um, uh, uh, yeah, good. So I mean, actually, one just just while we're having this discussion, so one little thing that you um, one thing that you you did say about the role that's imputed to these uh, hub nodes by some hub nodes enthusiasts, and I probably fall into that kind of category, uh, is that they are routers. For, and I certainly have seen. Uh, so some people have written papers that have used that exact word. Um, uh, I'll grant you, but. But I'm, I'm not so keen on that way of, of thinking of it. I would prefer to say that, they, that, these, uh, that the hub nodes mediate uh, influence between, between uh, regions, which I think is a less, you know, carries less, uh, you know, less controversy to it, I think. Um, OK, so, um, uh, so, so yeah, thank you very much uh, for that. So we'll come back, actually. I'd be interested in, in your view of, of one of the studies that I'm going to show in a second. But... Uh, but the reason I'm telling you about this is because this is, uh, was the basis for some of the experiments which and people did, uh, some of the modeling work which people did, which used this Kuramoto-like model and compared it to empirical data. Because the, because the networks that they used, so, so for the work that I just showed you now, uh, the networks that we were looking at were synthesized networks. So they were constructed, uh, just, you know, they were constructed by an algorithm. But then what uh, uh, some people have done is shown how you can take some of the networks that have been produced empirically, some of the structural networks that have been produced using DTI, uh, to, uh, and, and, and you use those networks and put os oscillators on the nodes, and you can kind of reproduce some aspects of, for example, resting state uh, fMRI uh, data. OK, so for those uh, who, who uh, uh, aren't familiar with, the, with this kind of thing, so this shows you um, some uh, white matter tracks produced by um, diffusion tense, diffusion spectrum imaging with um, uh, on, on this magnificent specimen of a brain here. It's mine, um, and uh, uh, this is so one of the one of the uh, nice things about having collaborators that do this stuff is that you've got an excuse to be a an allegedly healthy subject, and then you can play around with your own data, which is good fun. So this is uh, so this is my brain here, and uh, and so this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, that, that people do. They they will. Uh, 
uh, well, it, do <laughs> it does, yeah, unless you want to, uh, you know, you could produce that. Maybe, maybe after the talk, you can, you can sort of <laughs> inject some traces and stuff. Um, okay, so what they do uh, is they produce these, uh, 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 the, the tractography produces, well, it doesn't, it, this is obviously an imaging, the, 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 the tractography, uh, but then what, the, what you do is that you then parslate the, the, the cortex and you then uh, have to follow these tracks to produce, uh, you know, um, entries to your matrix of, of, of connections. Um, and when you do that, you, uh, you can then analyze it as a network in the kind of way that was, was discussed in the previous talk. And then, um, so this is one of the classic papers by... Uh, Patrick Hagman et al., where uh, Olaf Spawns is one of the, I think he's the senior author on this paper. And they showed that when you, uh, when you do this, you get, um, uh, well, you get a small world uh, network, and you get this, this collection of hub nodes in the, uh, uh, in the, along the medial axis of the, uh, of the brain. Um, okay, so now this is a, uh, uh, you know, this, the, the, uh, uh, network that they produced is indeed a pretty sparse network, and of course it does miss out. Actually, there's a lot of problems with this study, and, and it's very, very widely used, but, the, but um, you know, people have moved on from this particular matrix here, and there are much, much better ones, because there are lots of missing connections in this particular matrix. Um, but anyway, so you do get a, 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 you get a, a, a sparse, small world network that has this kind of modular structure and has these, these hub nodes. Now, uh, so we don't need to see that, in fact, that's not relevant. Um, okay, now the reason I'm, t actually let's just go back to that. So the re one of the main reasons I'm telling you about this is because this, this exact network that was produced by this study, by the Hagman et, et al. study, um, was then used to build uh, one of these oscillator type models uh, of the, you know, along the similar lines to what you've seen to, to, to mine. And, uh, and then you get, you actually, you know, to my great surprise actually, got some uh, results that actually, you know, lined up uh, to some extent, with uh, resting state fMRI. Now, I just I just wanted to, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a great enthusiast for this particular study, which I was the the lead author for, um, because I was got interested in. I hope I've got time to talk about this, right? So I was interested in the, uh, uh, and I have been for a while, interested in the avian brain, and I'm interested in the avian brain because uh, it is. Uh, you know, it's organized in a very different way to the mammalian, to the mammalian brain. So you, do, you don't have uh, uh, layered cortex in particular, and rather you have this sort of nucleated uh, structure. Um, and so I was, uh, uh, you know, very interested in the question of whether you get these kinds of uh, properties in the connectivity of the, of the, uh, of the avian brain. So, uh, so we produced, so I produced this, this study, which is actually a, a meta- study of uh, tracer studies. So this is not DTI. This, in fact, you, there's DTIs of limited value in the avian brain because, uh, because um, many of the long-range connections are, are diffuse and are not myelin myelinated, so you don't pick them up. You pick up some, but, but only some. Um, so this is a tracer study of the kind that, that was described earlier on. And it's, a, oh, and it's a meta study of the, of the uh, uh, literature on tracer studies. Now, the et al. here, uh, so I, I really, uh, I had a nice picture of the et al. My et al. Uh, is a bunch of avian neuroanatomists. And, um, and I was very pleased to recruit to this project uh, a crack team of avian neuroanatomists who are a bit like the SAS, but for avian neuroanatomy. So, um, so the, there's uh, Ono Gunter Kuhn and Martin Wilde and Vern Bingman and uh, Toru Shimizu are my, my co-authors. So these are four really top-notch uh, avian neuroanatomists, and they did the survey of the literature, um, and, uh, and I managed to get them locked in a room for two days to produce this matrix. And, uh, uh, and this matrix, interestingly, uh, is like the, the mouse brain, is pretty sparse. It's, um, uh, it's actually about 13% is the density of this. So that means to say that it's quite reasonable to talk about its small worldness or otherwise, uh, and, uh, you know, and Rich Club and all these other things. And should there be the same issue of, of low uh, density connection? Yeah, uh, well, that's a very good question, and I, and, and, and I was very keen to discuss this with them when we were doing, doing all of this. So, you know, what are we missing? We, you know, it's not weighted, and, uh, 
And uh, you know, this is definitely a shortcoming. It would be much better if it were weighted, but you know, the data just isn't there to make it weighted. Absent connections, I mean, they were, they were very reluctant to put any sentence in the, in the paper, quite rightly, to justify the blank cells because you never know, you know, somebody might do something, you know, there, no doubt there are cells that will be filled in one day by later, by later studies, but they were pretty confident in the majority of the blank cells um, that, you know, that somebody had done a tracer study and had looked for that connection um, and it had, you know, and it had not been found, they, they thought, in the majority of cases. So that was the kind of story I was getting from them, but I have to defer to, to, to those guys. But, of course, they're good scientists, so they were saying, oh, you know, we don't know when somebody might do something else and fill in the gaps. But what I, I mean, the impression I got from them was that we're not going to get the same kind of thing that happened with the macaque of, of their, of, of, of you, you know, somebody's going to discover loads and loads of, of, of extra connections and the matrix is going to be gradually filled in more and more to become more and more dense. That's the impression I got. So is that, does that fit with what you have seen with the mouse as well, do you think? Well, the mouse is done by, by the Allen Brain Institute people, so yeah. why they got uh, 50%, I, I, I don't know. 50%? Is, so the density is 50%? Mm. Oh, well, that's still very high, though, yeah. So I guess some of them are quite, uh, are quite low-weighting, you know, would, would, would require a low weight, I guess. So but Murray, can you say something about the, the objective criteria that were used to identify a single line in this graph? Yeah, okay. Well, so this is, so the objective criteria were that, um, uh, that they had basically done a survey of the, of, of the literature, and, uh, and, and these guys, in many cases, were the co-authors on, on the relevant studies. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, so a cell was filled in if uh, a connection had been reported uh, somewhere in the literature using, uh, and, and so we, we set out a table of all the kind of different tracers that were used for, for because there's some variation in the different tracers you use in different studies. You know, some are anterograde only and some are retrograde uh, only and some, so there's, you know, the, the, the so details the, are all there in the but paper. But effectively it reflects the opinion of the experts. It reflects the, hmm. well, yes, the, yes. I don't know if opinion is the right word. It reflects the research of the experts, right? It's not, I mean, it's not, this is a, uh, an opinion formed by, by carrying out the, 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 the tracer studies. So several decades of, of, of tracer studies. I, th I can't remember how many papers they surveyed, but uh, um, yeah. Um, and now, in the interesting thing is that when you do this sort of n complex network analysis, then certain of these uh, areas come up as, uh, as connector hubs, and, the, and what I thought was particularly interesting um, was the fact that, um, that these include, this is the area, so these are the slightly larger blobs in this diagram, are the connector hubs, and they include the area parahippocampalis here, so a par, a, you know, part of the hippocampal formation, and this NCL, that's the nidopallium cordolaterale, and the nidopallium cordolaterale is uh, reckoned to be the analog in the avian brain of the prefrontal cortex in the mammalian brain. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of justification for that. It's, it's a functional analog, whereas it's reckoned, with a little bit of controversy, that the APH is, a, uh, is an anatomical homologue of the hippocampal formation in the mammalian brain. So, you know, the, so, the, so the, there's a stronger connection there. But, but, um, but, but the interesting thing is that these are the two perhaps most cognitively prominent um, hub nodes that are, that are always identified in the human brain uh, as well, along with perhaps the precuneus in the human brain, but I have no idea what would be the analogue of the uh, precuneus in the, uh, in the avian brain, and believe me, I've tried to pin the avian neuroanatomists down on that question, and they're having none of it. They don't want to, they don't, there's no basis for any kind of, uh, you know, for that discussion, really. So. Okay, um, so, yeah, so that, this just summarises uh, that. Uh, so I added the word arguably there, you see, during, while I was listening to your talk. So the primate brain and the avian brain are arguably uh, hierarchically modulated with small world networks connected to core of hub nodes. And this is the interesting thing that I think we, uh, we sort of showed, that they both include these cognitively important prefrontal, in quotes, uh, regions, because it's not actually prefrontal in the avian brain, um, uh, and hippocampal uh, regions. 
Uh, okay, but really the real reason I was telling you uh, all of that actually is not because of the avian brain, uh, but because I wanted, just going back a couple of slides, I wanted you to know about this particular, this kind of uh, work producing these kinds of networks. Because these kinds of networks, which are, um, for better or for worse, are modular and small world, um, are used in these kinds of studies that, uh, the kind of study I'm going to tell you about now. I'll try and make it fairly short, I think, because we all want lunch, right? I desperately want lunch. Um, okay, so I, I'm sure many of you know about this, about the idea of, uh, of the, about the default mode network. So, uh, so when you do um, magnetic resonance uh, imaging uh, with a subject and you ask the subject to just lie in the scanner with their uh, with their eyes uh, closed usually, just resting and doing nothing in particular, so they have no task to, to perform, they're just lying there, um, then a distinctive uh, uh, pattern of active regions um, uh, seems, to, uh, seems to show up um, very, very reliably. And one of those patterns of active regions, so you get different collections of regions um, pop up uh, you know, with, with different sort of frequencies, um, so one of them is the so-called default mode network. And this is showing the default mode network. It's the orange bits. And they, they include, this is, the, uh, this is prefrontal cortex. So this is, um, uh, this is a medial view. So you're looking, so you, we split the brain and you're looking at the brain, whichever hemisphere it is, you're looking at it from, you're looking at the middle of it, right? So this is the prefrontal um, uh, region. This is the precuneus here. Well, it actually covers more than the precuneus, I think. And this is part of the hippocampal formation. And, um, and then you're seeing uh, sort of, the, the, again, the prefrontal bit there, a bit of the hippocampal formation there. Um, so the same kinds of, so interestingly, the same uh, region seems to, seem to pop up as are identified in these studies of um, the um, hub nodes in, in, the, uh, uh, um, in these structural studies. Okay, now, so the, so the blue means less active, yeah. So the blue means, mean, so in, in this, at this time, these areas are, acti are actually less active than the baseline. And these uh, areas are typically ones that are more active during tasks. So there's this interesting anti-correlation between uh, those that are active during tasks and those that are active uh, during rest. Um, okay, so now, um, so now here's the, uh, uh, the, 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 the paper that... Um, suddenly made all of this oscillator stuff uh, seem relevant rather than just a bit of uh, interesting fun that could get into an obscure maths uh, journal. So this was published by Joanna Cabral and the uh, um, senior author is Gustavo Deco and it was done right here in Barcelona um, by in Gustavo Deco's group. So, uh, so this was very, very interesting. Joanna Cabral, who's a PhD student of Gustavo's, um, turned up to my lab at, in, in Imperial and said, I've got, got something, you, Gustavo forwarded me your chaos paper and I've got something interesting I want to show you. And um, I said, well, yeah, yeah, you know, come along. And she opened her laptop and uh, she showed me something that made my jaw drop at the time because she showed that if you set up a collection of these Kuramoto oscillators, exactly the kind of thing that I uh, had described earlier on, and instead of using a synthesized network, you used a network, they used exactly that, that Hagman network that we saw on an earlier slide. So you use an empirically derived structural network and you set these things going. Then you could reproduce uh, some of the statistical properties of, uh, uh, of resting state activity. So the default mode, mode network, for example. And this is from her paper um, just showing you, you know, the sort of pipeline of, of, of what you do. So you do the, the tractography uh, or, or rather, sorry, you take the, the, the network that was derived from the tractography you then use this Kuramoto model, um, which I just described, using so 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 where each um, uh, uh, node in this structural network is one of these Kuramoto oscillators. Uh, that you then apply this uh, balloon Winkessel model, which is meant to be a hemodynamic model, which is meant to model the bold signal, and you do various uh, other bits of processing, um, and then you can compare it with the uh, empirical bold signal you get. Um, uh, during resting state in resting state fMRI, and you know they had surprisingly good correlation. And the thing, and this is again from from her paper. Um, so the thing that uh, that, it, that excited me was that that, that she, what she showed was that you only get this correlation. And this is showing part of the parameter space, the delay and the coupling 
strength, and but you can imagine blowing this picture out and you'd have much bigger blue areas all around here. And, and this uh, red is showing where you get high, coral, uh, you get high uh, metastability. So this is the region that she chose um, to use. You get um, uh, high metastability when you choose these parameters. And that's where the correlation uh, you know, is, is, is high. And the later work sort of honed in on that more precisely. So basic, basically, you only get this correlation when it's producing these metastable chimera states, which I discovered in this, in this other paper. Now, there's, this is very, I, you know, I still think this is kind of, um, you know, this, doing this kind of uh, model is still a very new area, and you can ask a lot of methodological questions, and we can do a great deal of work to try and refine what's going on and throw it in, into question. But nevertheless, I was completely thrilled to find that this totally abstract model that I had been looking at was applicable to, uh, to real data and, uh, and you know, could at least, to some extent, reproduce some, something of the real data. Uh, so then, Joe, so I'm giving you a bit of uh, the relevant history here, partly because it's come, you know, it comes a bit from Barcelona. You know. It's like going to the Picasso Museum and you realize how important Barcelona was to Picasso. Well, uh, so, so it's not quite comparable, but you know, this is how important Barcelona is to this bit of work, right? So. Um, so, uh, so then uh, Joanna Cabral and I gave this joint talk at Hammersmith Hospital um, where I described the mathematical model and she described the stuff that you've just seen, uh, you know, obviously a lot better than, than, and in more detail than I've uh, just, just done. Um, and in the audience were uh, some, uh, a, a bunch of people who are interested in, in, in computer modeling, including this PhD student Pete Hellier here and Rob Leach and uh, a number of other people. Uh, and they thought this was a pretty interesting idea, and they, they picked up this model and, um, uh, and tried to uh, apply it to two different, to, to not only to model resting state, but to model, um, model a task condition as well, and to compare the two. And we found that, uh, that you could, uh, you know, you, you, again, you could reproduce something of the qualitative data. Now, this is... Um, uh, I, I haven't really got time to go into a, into a lot of details, because there are, and there are a lot of questions that you could ask about this. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, we got it into the Journal of Neuroscience anyway, so who cares, right? Uh, no, that was just a joke. That was just a joke. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've had really good stuff rejected from good journals. So uh, uh, anyway, um, so the interesting thing is that in the, so, so now we've got the two conditions. There's a task condition and a resting state condition. And the really essential uh, property of the, uh, of the data is that our, um, uh, our proxy measure, empirical measure for metastability, basically uh, in the task condition, the metastability goes down, right? And at the same time, the, um, uh, the oh, at the same time, what I wanted to really show you was at the same time, the synchrony goes up. Uh, the scales are a little bit misleading here. You, you mentioned sort of shrinking this. This has actually gone up quite a bit, this, this uh, synchrony. So that's what, that's what ha is happening in the real, uh, in the real data. And then in our model, where we modeled the two conditions by modulating certain, certain regions, we uh, managed to achieve, to achieve the same uh, effect, where the, uh, um, in the uh, task condition, the metastability goes down and, um, and the synchrony and the synchrony goes, no, sorry, that's the, we want the model, and the synchrony goes up. Uh, they, they look very different in the two pictures, but in fact, that's just the scale that they're, that they're on. Um, so, uh, so, you know, so that's another, there was another hint that maybe there's something in these models that you actually can use, this rather crude model, to perhaps model, uh, you know, represent something of, the, of, of brain dynamics. Now, there really are a lot of questions you could ask, and we, I think there's a lot of work to be done to uh, home to uh, hone this as a, as, a, as a technique. But we're kind of, but we're working on that. So I'm just gonna very quickly, actually, in the last, have I got five minutes, talk about magic mushrooms. Okay, um, uh, so, so one of the bits of work that we're doing is looking at, um, uh, uh, at magic mushrooms. So one of our other colleagues at Imperial has done some really great work with psilocybin. So psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And uh, so Robin Carhart Harris has done some re really great pioneering work, and he's somehow got a license to, um, uh, to uh, administer psilocybin to 
uh, willing volunteers, it's not hard to find them amongst the student body, um, to willing volunteers um, and, uh, uh, and, they, and then uh, basically scan them, right? So, so we do rest, you do resting state, skates, resting state scans on subjects. Of course, there's a control condition where they're just administered with a placebo, th um, uh, and, there's, and there's, the, uh, you know, there's the psilocybin condition, but the uh, subjects pretty soon work out which is which. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's, the difference is pretty strong. Um, uh, uh, anyway, so he's done some great work. So this is, you know, real hardcore science showing, showing, what come, uh, showing the differences that come up. But one way you can characterize the difference between the psilocybin condition and the normal resting state condition is that, is, is that you seem to get an increase in metastability. And, um, uh, and, and that's something that, 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 that's sort of very interesting. I think I'm, I think I'm going to gloss over this quite a bit because it really is work in progress. This is, this is unpublished and needs work. But we tried to, what we have done is um, uh, is um, so this is uh, so this is the empirical data, right? So this is showing so the you know I, I, I mean this is worth seeing just for the title of the slide, right? Um, so so this is uh, showing um, the resting state fMRI uh, data, uh, the placebo versus the psilocybin condition. And this is looking at the, uh, at the, at the metastability measure, which is the variance, which is essentially the variance in synchrony. So it's, a very, it's a, an analogous measure to the one that we use in the mathematical model. And so in the psilocybin condition, this measure goes, goes right up, basically. And so we we're, in, we're interested in trying to reproduce this with our Kuramoto uh, models. So, and there's a, there's a kind of big picture, picture here. I mean, this, I will talk about this just for one minute. So, so, so I think this is, is a sort of, um, uh, I think this is one of the things that we're sort of interested in, you, is, is the fact that, that, no, this is too complicated. No, never mind. Okay, I, I'll just move on very, I, sorry, I, I, I'm aware that we all want lunch. I really want lunch. So I'm, so I'm going to, I'm just going to move on to showing you very quickly the, uh, some of the results that we've, uh, that we've, uh, we've, that we've preliminary results that we've produced. Um, so, so we, so the way the psilocybin works is it's uh, uh, is it's a 5-HT2 uh, agonist, 5-HT2 uh, agonist. I believe that's right. Is it? I've got it written here somewhere. Um, and if you look at the um, uh, the distribution of um, synapses that are sensitive to to this 5-HT. Um, then 5-HT2N, then, then you find that they're far more prevalent, surprisingly, in these uh, hub node regions, so like the precuneus, the prefrontal cortex. So, so the density of, uh, uh, of, of the 5-HT2N receptors is much higher in all of those regions that keep popping up in all of these studies. So they're, 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 they're densest in, um, yeah, the precuneus, the prefrontal cortex, and these kinds of uh, medial uh, areas. Um, so in our model, what we do is we perturb or, or we modulate the, uh, the effect of those regions, those uh, um, core regions, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to try and reproduce the, uh, you know, what's going on in the psilocybin uh, condition. And basically, we, you know, under lots of circumstances, we get very similar uh, results where the metastability, so this is going, f so it, when we looked at the task condition, if you looked at the the, the resting state, you went from resting state to task condition, and metastability goes down, synchrony goes up uh, in, empirically, and that's what we want to reproduce in the model. Going uh, with the psilocybin, you go from resting state to psilocybin, the metastability goes up and the synchrony goes down. So it's the opposite effect. And, um, and we managed to reproduce this by modulating just these central core uh, regions, and lots, there are lots of variations on this. So, so you can modulate the core versus modulating everything else. And this, what this shows is that modulating the core, has, which is just a very small number of regions, has an enormous effect on the model. And, uh, and the synchrony goes down and so on. Uh, modulating just the precuneus has uh, a pretty substantial effect, whereas modulating everything but the precuneus, uh, everything else in the same way, has you know, very little effect on this. So anyway, so this is some preliminary... Um, oh, you can also modulate exactly the regions according to the uh, uh, Allen Institute's map of these 5-HT2A receptors as well. Um, anyway, so we basically kind of can qualitatively reproduce 
some of those uh, uh, results with the psilocybin as well, using these Kuramoto, uh, 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 Kuramoto models. Um, so I think I should stop there. So just my, my concluding remarks. Okay, so I, so I guess the sort of working hypothesis for a lot of my work at the moment is that metastability in the brain is, is a hallmark of a playful exploratory dynamics which promotes adaptation and, and innovation. There's a whole talk to give on, you know, high-level talk on why I think that's important. Uh, low metastability, well, this is kind of the slide I didn't give. Low metastability, I think, in, tends to entail repetitive stereotypical behavior. Um, in fact, what I think these, the work on the psilocybin has shown is that the normal brain doesn't actually maximize the metastability. That's, I mean, psilocybin tends to make it increase it. You, you don't want to be in this kind of very highly metastable state all the time because uh, then you're kind of, you know, uh, well, I mean, there are people like that in California, right? <laughs> and they, um, so it stimulates creati creativity, but it does compromise coherent, goal-directed thought. Um, and, and in our model, basically, we can reproduce this kind of thing, modulating the connective core in our module, model does modulate metastability in the same, uh, in the same kind of, of, of ways. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take some questions just for allowing this get to the last moment. So uh, uh, who has a question? Hi. Uh, in your model, you're considering mostly, uh, or consider one single frequency for, for all the oscillations. Yeah. But well, when we, we look for the, all the oscillation, oscillation theory, you would see a lot of different frequencies. Yeah, 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 yeah. And mostly that the coupling between them would have some effect depending on if it's a long connectivity or short connectivity. Mm. In special, you'd have all this kind of uh, cross-frequency coupling. Mm -hmm. And what kind of eff effect do you expect somehow in yeah. this kind of analysis? Yeah, okay, so that's an, uh, an excellent question. So, so in the model, the model that I looked at is, uh, so, so the, uh, the values for the natural frequencies of the oscillators, they don't have any, um, uh, you know, they don't correspond to any real uh, they, they're unitless, uh, you know, quantities, so they, they're an abstract thing. But then when you start to build, you start to make it more empirically valid, then you need to put, you're, you're going to put actual numbers on what the omega frequency, you know, you, that you, you care about what that stands for in terms of hertz. So uh, in Joanna Cabral's model, then she focused on gamma um, frequencies, so all of the empirical values are based on the idea that that's a gamma uh, frequency there. Um, but uh, which, as you say, is just focusing very much on just one very narrow band. Um, so I, I really think we're just scratching the surface of these kinds of ideas. And of course, when you do look at the brain, the, the, the real dynamics that's going on is immensely complex and baffling. And you've got so many, you've got a lot of different frequencies, lots of different kind of synchronization relationships that are, are coming and going all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of throw up my hands in uh, a little bit, but I can tell you that so I, I have got a PhD student called David Baumick who has published uh, one paper in PLOS, um, uh, which um, uh, actually is a spiking neuron model, so it's a lot more biologically realistic. And there, we looked at a similar range of phenomena, the sort of metastability, synchrony, um, uh, and there we do look at different frequencies and how different frequencies interact with each other. So I can point you to that paper, and we've got another one in the pipeline. But again, I think that's probably just scratching the surface. Um, uh, it's very complex when you, when you start to look at the details, yeah. I'm kind of in a metastable state myself now, because on yeah. one side, I think it's, it's very interesting and intriguing, the correlations that you find between the model and what you will find in fMRI data. Yeah. And the other side, a little bit critical in how far your model is just under constraint. So I would love to ask a little bit, so how difficult was it really to get this, and how many possibilities of, yeah. of changing parameters do you have to actually get this? Because yeah, yeah. at the end, you can always get what you want if you just have enough parameters to Yeah, yeah, chew. absolutely. Well, that's why I'm, I'm very I was, uh, I'm a bit reluctant to talk about the psilocybin work, which I think is, is very preliminary, and, uh, and that's because I'm not really satisfied with, with the extent to which we cherry-pick the parameters. And I think we need to... to, to so you can get the kinds of um, qualitative differences that you've seen with a, with, with a number of different parameters, 
Um, and I think it's important that we, that we justify the, our choice of, pr of, of parameters, so, uh, you know, uh, empirically. So, um, so one thing that you can do, for example, is, you, is that you can uh, pin down the, the so, so really there are, there are two main parameters to the model, actually, which is the, the coupling strength and the, and the delay. And you can, so that was that, those kind of um, little color um, temperature maps that you saw were showing that. Um, but you can pick your, your parameter by trying to maximize the correlation with resting state data um, and then fix the, your parameters there and then show that when you fix your parameters there, then, then you know, the other phenomena you're trying to model um, are modeled accurately. So I, that, that seems to be reasonable, uh, reasonable to me. Um, uh, uh, I, you know, I, 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 you'd have to ask my co-authors for, on, on the, for the Journal of Neuroscience paper about exactly how they chose the, the, uh, the parameters uh, there. But certainly in the kind of future work, I think we want to be uh, very rigorous in the way we're picking those, picking those parameters. So. Would you see any way to apply it to more robotic application or to any task at all that you would see that such a model would be able to solve a cognitive, perceptive task? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, that's the kind of question that I'm fundamentally interested in and that kind of brought me into thinking about all of this in the first place. And... Um, uh, and I'm certainly I'm extremely interested in playful dynamics. I mean, I think one of the things that's really lacking in in uh, in AI and and robotics uh, is playful dynamics, actually. And and I think that's the in some in some ways that's part of the brain's secret is that there's always playful dynamics going on, and it's something that we've barely thought about really in in AI and in robotics. Um, so certainly, I think that it's very. Uh, it, 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 it's uh, very important to have this kind of playful dy dynamics in, uh, you know, in human thought. We, could, we've, you know, our creative thought, where we, we we try to come up with an innovative solution to a problem, or where a child in particular comes up with an innovative solution to a problem, um, uh, then uh, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty sh sure that that's because you've got all of this rich dynamics going on. Um, that are lights on a solution. Actually, the I I, I encountered a. Uh, there's a beautiful paper by two of the authors that you mentioned, um, uh, the um, Romanian postdoc that you mentioned with the difficult to pronounce name, double-barreled name. But she and and that and that uh, other author produced an amazing paper um, on how you can solve satisfiability problems with um, uh, with continuous dynamical systems. And I thought this was just the most extraordinary paper I'd ever read because to a computer scientist, the idea that you can solve uh, satisfiability problems, which are the quintessence of you know NP complete search problems, with a continuous dynamical system that's basically kind of going all over the place and then converges on a solution. Uh, you know, I thought that was really an amazing uh, uh, discovery. You know, it doesn't interest computer scientists that much because it's slow, and uh, you know, but just the fact that it does it at all is amazing. And I think the brain is very much more like that kind of dynamical system uh, than it is like the kind of things uh, uh, that that computer scientists and AI scientists try to build, and that's what I want to move towards, really. Yeah, Tohokai. Tohokai, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, Murray, would you, uh, are you wanting then to move towards the more sort of functional understanding of the cognitive architecture that, for instance, the global workspace stuff you were doing early, earlier, do you see this as feeding into that then, in, in a, a richer model for, uh, for these kinds yeah, of things? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I do see it feeding into that, but that's such a difficult question. I <laughs> the relationship between the global workspace architecture uh, and the connective core, I think, is uh, you know I think there is a, a, a an important relationship there, um, which I'm very interested in continuing to ex to explore. Uh, and I do think you know it does seem to be that that it promotes kind of some kind of integration, um, uh, and that that's important for, for for getting the right kind of dynamics that can converge on solutions to cognitively difficult problems in the, you know using this rich dynamics but it's 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 a big complicated story that i, I, I you know it's still very hazy in my mind and uh, but yeah i see these things as very much related yeah okay. any more questions oh right, very hungry i think <laughs> so let's say another big thank you to all the corners